Begin. All right. My name is Matt Matera. I work for pewterreport.com. Pewter Report is a uh, credential media website that has been covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for over 25 years. We cover them all year round. So obviously when the season's going on, we're there every single day in the, well, before COVID in the locker room, interviewing right. players, writing stories, um, we have uh, we have a podcast called the Peter Report podcast that we air four times a week. We're always writing stories. Uh, my technical title is Bucks Beat Writer, but I do so much more than that. Like I said, the, the interviews, I edit our podcast. I run our Twitter account that has almost 40,000 followers. Um, a lot of photo and video along with the writing and everything like that. And um, like I said, we don't even we cover the bucks all year round. So it's not even just the football season. It's, you know, the off season as well, the NFL draft, free agency, uh, training camp, all of that. So, um, we've been doing this for 25 years. I'm in my third year with the, with Peter report. I started as an intern and then got brought on full time last season and Bruce Arians first season coaching the bucks. And, it's really been great. I, I really enjoy doing this. I have a ton of fun and put in a lot of hard work too. So uh, I'm very lucky to be working for Peter Report. So are you originally a Bucks guy or is it just this where the job took you? No. So I, I actually grew up on Long Island in New York and lived there, you know, pretty much my whole life going to you know high school there and everything. And then um, I went to the University of Tampa in Florida. So that kind of brings my connection to the Buccaneers. Right. I actually grew up a diehard Jets fan. So it's funny that I'm covering Tom Brady now. Um, but yeah, I went to school for sports management, had a lot of different internships and a lot of good work and experience there. And then when I graduated, I got a job actually working in minor league baseball for the Pittsburgh Pirates minor league affiliate. And it, it wasn't a bad job. But I just, it was more of like a events operations type of thing. And I just, I don't know. I knew in my heart of hearts, I, I always want to work in sports more in the media side. Right. Um, I want to be like a play-by-play -play broadcaster. So I ended up going back to school to um, this school called the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. They have it like all over familiar, the yeah. country. Yeah, I, it's all over the country. It's not just in Connecticut. So there was a school in Tampa and long story short, I learned a lot of cool stuff there, especially on the audio and video editing side of things. And one of the teachers there is now one of my bosses at Peter Report. Okay. So I connected with him, told him what I wanted to do. And I, I had done some writing for a, a radio station when I was interning at University of Tampa. So I sent him some of my stuff and then he invited me out to help out with them on a volunteer basis, pretty much. And then that turned into an internship, into... Uh, you know, full-time job. So oh, that's pretty much my story about getting into the business, I would okay. say. Now, let me ask you one of these pretty standard questions, but a little little spin on it. Sure. Okay, so you say you cover the Bucks all year round, yeah. and when that fateful day comes that, hey, we're getting Tom Brady. Now, are you thinking at that point, we've got the Super Bowl here in Tampa, we've got Tom Brady coming in, what are the chances – just a possibility that we're going to be able to play a home game for the Super Bowl. Oh, it definitely crossed my mind. I mean, when you get the greatest quarterback of all time, you instantly upgrade your team <laughs> in any department. Honestly, the, the first thing that really crossed my mind when, when Brady signed here, and because before that, the Bucs were a 7-9 and nine team that could have been 9-7, and seven, could have been possibly 10-6, and six, but they had so many self-inflicted mistakes whether it's penalties or they obviously had a lot of turnovers so the big thing when Brady got here was that you knew he was going to turn the ball over less but I was just more interested in how they were going to incorporate his game and the type of offense that he's been running for 20 years and how that's right. going to mix with Bruce Arians type of offense because you knew the Bucks had a ton of weapons I mean Mike Evans is one of the best receivers in the game uh Chris Godwin one of the best receivers in the game and then as the season went on they signed Antonio Brown after Brady, they got Gronk. So I was really more curious about how that offense was going to gel, or better yet, when it was going to gel. Because when it was going to gel, you knew they could be a Super Bowl contender. Contender. It was just about 
when everything was going to hit for them. And it finally did. I would say when they really got in their groove, I would say it was um, right after the bye week. They had a late bye right. week. I believe it was week 12. And then they haven't lost since, since that bye. Well, now we all have that, that I'm a Browns fan. I hate to say it, but I am. Hey, well, it's yeah, getting I better know. for it's you. Been brutal. It's been brutal. But you, you <laughs> have that moment where you're like, everyone's, hey, they're, they're a contender. They're, there's that moment where you say, reality check. Mm. Are they really going to be as good as the hype? Or is this the team, as her, uh, Edwards just say, this is who they are? Before the bye week, are you really thinking we can really get there? Are you thinking this team is about as good as it's going to get? Yeah, it was a little dicey because right before that bye, they were seven and five and they had lost three of four. And those three losses in the three of four was against the Saints. It was a home game for the Bucs where they got destroyed 38 to three. And then they lost to the Rams on it was either Sunday night or, or Monday night football, but it, it was a primetime game. And then they lost to the Kansas City Chiefs, who they're about to play in the Super Bowl. Now they had a quality win against the Packers. But that was early in the season. It was a 38 to 10 win. It was a blowout. But that was that was very early on. There was definitely reason to have doubts because they didn't necessarily have those quality wins that everyone likes to talk about in college football. But, you know, people can right. bring it over to, uh, to to the NFL as well. I always thought, again, if you look at that Kansas City game, they were down 20 to 7 at halftime. But they really started turning the tides in the second half. They changed their defensive right. alignment. They started covering Tyreek Hill better by putting two safeties in the back and playing cover two. And they almost made that comeback in the second half against Kansas City. They started throwing the ball more and imp implementing play action. And play action has been huge for the Buccaneers this season. And Bruce Arian said himself, too, that he looks at that second half of the Kansas City game as the real turning point or the point where things started clicking for the Bucks, So I think the way they played in that second half, they didn't necessarily carry it over into the next game because their following game, they beat the Minnesota Vikings, but their game after that, they played Atlanta and they went down big against Atlanta, but then they, they turned it on in the second half and they scored 30 points. And it just showed that this team, they can score 30 points in the blink of an eye and they right. have impact players on defense that play better when they have a lead. They can just pin their ears back and get after the quarterback. So while there was certainly doubts, you could always believe in this team because you knew they had the product there to get it done for sure. Well, and the, the funny thing about replacing Jameis with Brady was you were looking at fewer turnovers, but during that odd stretch, they were turnover prone. So you're looking at, all right, the reason we were, we made this move and we're going this direction was to be more, have more ball security and to be more of a responsible team. And yet mm. we're not there. Uh-oh. So you come back from the bye week, and now you start playing that solid ball. Because I know as a fan from afar, you're thinking, you know, it's a lot of hype. It's a lot of hooey, blah, blah, blah. You got all the weapons. How are you going to make this work? And then, like you said, you come back from the bye week, and it clicks. Now you're, are you thinking, we're going to be this team, or we still have work to do? I thought it was still they, – they still had work to do. Really, just because following the bye, the teams that they played were not – top level teams they beat right. the vikings who didn't make the playoffs they played um the falcons twice who obviously we know what was going on with them and they right. played another team I th they played another team that was sub 500 so it was it was that playoff game against new orleans where they i guess you can kind of say they they slayed the dragon because the saints had been winning the nfc south for multiple years now they beat the bucks twice and beat them pretty handily the way that they beat New Orleans with getting all those turnovers and they, they really gave Drew Brees a hard time. Now, I know he, after it came out that he was very injured, but I mean, they still held Michael Thomas to no catches. Right. They got multiple turnovers and they set the offense up great. That was the big moment of this team can do it. They beat the one team that they just could not get over the top against. And once they did that, I think it really, I mean, it was only one more game against the, the Packers, but that really opened up the floodgates for that. This team can go all the way by having such a statement win like that. Now you're looking at, from that point of view, now you go to, we're looking at the chiefs again, again, we've already yeah. faced them once and you have a veteran team. So you have a veteran team facing a team for the second time. 
which should be a positive. But we also know that Andy Reid coming off a of bye week is almost invincible. So let's break it down a little bit here. Yep. First of all, I think the key to the game on both sides are not going to be the offense. It's going to be your D-line on both sides. So let's start from there, D-line to D-line. Okay, so the big difference for the Bucs is definitely that they have Vita Vea playing in this game. He uh, broke his ankle back on the Thursday night football game against the Chicago Bears. He was out for the rest of the season, and then he came back. And it kind of like came out of nowhere. We had asked Coach Arians later into the season, like, is there any chance that Vita Vea can come back? And he played it off. He he didn't really think it was going to happen. But – and I got to say, I was a little surprised too. I didn't – I didn't. I thought Vita Bay would play well. I didn't think he would have like a huge impact on the game because he's going to be on a snap count. But man, if you go back and watch that game again, having Vita Vea in the middle, he automatically takes up two blockers and he pushes that line all the way back. He's always been a good run stuffer. He's very young in his career. He's always been good at being a run stuffer, but he really improved on his pass rush this season. And you saw it in the Green Bay game where he was pushing that line of scrimmage further back, which made Rodgers have to go to the outside. And then Shaq Barrett and JPP cleaned it up from there. I mean, right. not just because Rodgers going to the outside, but the fact that Shaq and JPP are only going to get one-on-one matchups now because you have to double team Vita Vea or he's just going to eat you. <laughs> he's going to eat you alive in the middle. I mean, we didn't really see too much from Shaq or JPP in the, the other two playoff games. And then they went insane in the NFC Championship game. So that's going to be the key right there with the defensive line. The Bucs have a great run defense. They're the number one run defense in the league. So I'm not really too concerned about them stopping the run. I think the big thing is, is they have to be able to get to Patrick Mahomes with a four-man rush. Because right. you could send all the guys you want. Devin White is a great blitzer for this team. He had nine sacks on the season. That was second best on the team. He was a half a sack behind JPP for the lead. He probably would have got it, but he missed the last game of the season uh, when, when he got COVID. But, and I went back and, and watched the, the uh, Bucks chiefs game, the, their first one. Patrick Mahomes just gets the ball out so fast that, I don't think you could bring the blitz too much because he's going to know where to go and where to beat it right away. So I think the key for the Bucs defensive line is going to be that you have to get home with the four-man front, and that's going to be all on Shaq Barrett and Jason Pierre-Paul. On the flip side, the Chiefs are going to dare you to run the ball because they like to play with three defensive backs. They're just egging you on to, to run the ball. The Bucks offensive line has been great in this postseason. It was a little bit of a question mark going into it, only for the reason that, one, their uh, right guard, Alex Kappa, broke his leg in the game against Washington in the postseason. So they had to put in backup guard Aaron Stinney. And anytime you put in a backup, you know they're going, going to attack that guy. And then outside on the tackles, Donovan Smith can be a really great player, but there's times where... He, he doesn't take plays off, but there's times where his technique isn't up to par where it should be, and then he could play a whole good game, but if he allows a sack or two, that's what the people focus on. But Donovan Smith has been exceptional in this postseason, blocking some of the toughest pass rushers that you can see in the game. I mean, Chase Young and Montez Sweat in the Washington game, and uh, you know Cam Jordan right. and um, did a great job against the, the Packers as well, too. And Tristan Wirfs is a rookie. He's playing like an all pro. He's going to be solid. He's going to be great for a very long time for the Bucs. The thing, though, is it almost played into the Bucs' hands a little bit, too, where Washington and New Orleans and Green Bay, for the most part, too, they real they none of them really blitzed that much. Their thing was they wanted to win getting the four man pass rush. But if you saw in that game against the Packers, when the Packers did blitz, they were getting to Tom Brady. They, they only had one sack in the game. But one of Tom Brady's last interceptions, it was a third and two, and they blitzed off the edge, and Leonard Fournette went to the other yeah. side, so he didn't have time to get over and pick up the blitz. And that led Brady to just throwing one up. He was hoping that Mike Evans could find it. He couldn't track it, so it ended up being an interception. I think Kansas City is going to blitz more than, than the Bucks have seen in this postseason, and I think that's really going to be a big factor in, in terms of uh, the offensive and defensive line there. 
Well, I think when you have Ndamukong Sue playing on the end instead of in the middle, what you're looking at now is you're playing basically now with Vita Vea back, I'm sorry, basically two nose tackles playing on that side and then the right side. Yes. So anything coming that way, you know, and we're looking at uh, Clyde edwards Lair and even Le'Veon Bell, who like to kind of dance and find a hole, you're looking at two really stout guys. You're not going to find a hole there. So you're going to have to go to the other side, and now you're looking at your defensive ends and being over on that side. And then, as you mentioned, getting getting home with four guys, it's not necessarily the front four, but it's four guys. So you're going to be Correct. able to maybe shoot somebody here, bring somebody back, shoot somebody there, but you can only really go with four and then get there. Because right. you leave too much space – yeah, Patrick Holmes is going to beat you alive, right? And and that's what that's what Todd Bowles really likes to do is he, he will give you a look and then blitz from like a separate side. He's yeah. great at just having like if you watch the still image of the Bucks lined up defensively, there are going to be a lot of weird things going on. Like there was one point in the in the Packers game where Domkin Sue was lined up like a linebacker, and like you know you're never going to see something like that. Um, the Bucks do do a good job as well is um, one of their safeties, Antoine Winfield Jr. He's great at blitzing off the edge. Uh, he, he usually causes a lot of issues when, when he's blitzing there. Um, there's times they'll move Jason Pierre Paul on the inside and get, get him an inside rusher. There's definitely a lot of things that Todd Bowles does that can try to distract a quarterback. I don't know if that's necessarily going to work on someone like Patrick Mahomes, but he definitely draws up some very interesting things. I think you're not going to confuse him, but you still can get home. And that's yeah. what you have to do. You're not going to make him sit there at the, at the point of attack and go, I don't know what they're doing. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But what he's going to do is say, I've got pressure coming from here. I've got pressure coming from here. I may have to get rid of it faster, or I may have to try and spin out. And then you've got the edge guys keeping him in containment. And especially if his toe isn't where it's supposed to be, that's going to be a very vital thing too. I'm glad you brought that up. Because I think something that the Buffalo Bills weren't really totally able to do in the AFC Championship game is they didn't really get Mahomes on the run that much. Now, if you're healthy enough to play and you're going to play, you shouldn't do anything illegal by any means. I'm saying like don't right. stomp on his foot or something like that. But if you know, <laughs> but if you know that he's got a turf toe or he's got a foot injury, and he's playing in the game, why not try to make him? Move around a little bit if you can get to him by uh, by getting pressure on him. Now, he's had two weeks to recover. I'm sure he's feeling much better than he did going to the AFC Championship game. But that's something to keep in mind if the Bucs can get some pressure on him. If Mahomes has to keep rolling out and rolling out, and obviously he's great at throwing sidearm and making something out of nothing. But we don't know how injured he is. He'll say he's okay, but we don't really know what percentage-wise how hurt he is. If they can put some stress on him by having to keep running and, and then that turf dough starts acting up a little bit, that could be a factor in the game if the Bucs do it the right way. Okay, so we, yeah, and that's, I think that's the key is you have to see what he can do and then react accordingly. Now, going back to, we've already pretty much locked down what we're looking at defensively. What are we looking at as far as our, our as your running game? I know who you have, but who are we going to deploy? And because if you get a lead, you know, Fournette and Rojo are going to be very important, but are they up to the task right now? I think they are up to the task. I mean, the Bucks had 75 rushing yards in uh, in the game against the, the Packers, but the previous two games, they ran wild on everyone. I mean, they had over, I think, right around 150 rushing yards against Washington. They had another 126 yards against New Orleans uh defense who is a very stout defense so getting that much should uh getting that much is you know something you can hang your hat on the thing with the the bucks have been it's funny because like the whole season ronald jones has really been the guy but then he got covid and he broke his finger and like there's a point leonard fournette coming after the bye he was a healthy and active they didn't dress him for the game coming out of the bye but i mean there's no question he's really turned it up in, in the postseason. I mean, that's why they call him playoff playoff Lenny. Right. The Bucks can definitely run the ball. They they didn't run it great in the NFC Championship game. But like I said before, the Chiefs are going to dare you to run the ball. And Byron Leftwich, the offensive coordinator, is 
you know, even if you're not getting some success in the run game, he'll stick with it. He's not going to abandon it. I don't know if that's necessarily a great idea because you can't go down 14 nothing to to the Chiefs well, and then be like, no, we're gonna we're gonna keep running the ball. That's why I really think play action is going to be key. Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones are very capable. Ronald Jones hasn't really had a big splash in the postseason. He didn't play in the Washington game. He had a quad injury as well, too. So I'm not too sure if if those if the if the finger injury and the, and the quad has really limited him that much. But he's a guy that can break a huge run. He's kind of like their energizer back. When he gets going, he can rip off good 10, 15 yard runs that Leonard Fournette doesn't necessarily do as much. Now he had a great run. I keep I keep going back to the NFC Championship game, but he had that great spin move, a 20 yard touchdown run. Right. right. Both guys are very capable. Where Fournette does have an advantage, and I know you're talking about the run game, but to be a running back in a Bucs offense, you have to be able to block, and that's why Fournette gets a lot of the third downs. And that's what hurts Ronald Jones as well, is that he's not the best receiving running back. And I don't necessarily know if Brady loves throwing him the ball. Where Leonard Fournette is a little more shorthanded. He's had some drops, but he's going to be key on third down as well. Because when you talk the run game, you got to talk about running backs and can receive as well. But to answer your question, they are very capable of getting it done. They they have a track record of getting it done in big moments, and I don't see why they, they couldn't do it for this game. Well, the one thing you're looking at, you want your running back in this in the pass offense, in this offense, to be able to be to be able to protect the passer. Because yeah. looking at the weapons you have on the outside with you know, with Godwin, with Evans, with Gronkowski, with Brait, you know, mm-hmm. you can throw four or five receivers out there where you don't need to have your running back is involved in the pass game. Plus you've, you've got a, a slew of tight ends. They're going to be able to take over that over the middle stuff. So you're okay there. Uh, the idea being when you get a lead, here's the odd thing about the chiefs. The chiefs don't mind you getting a lead on them. Not they at all. They went down, behind. they went down yeah. 10, nothing. They went t- down 10, nothing against Buffalo. I remember last season too. They were playing the Texans and they went down by a bunch and then they were losing to the Titans too. in the AFC championship mm-hmm. game and they came back. So oh, well, yeah, no lead is safe going against Kansas city. And so what I, I guess where the, where I was going with that is that you can't just say we've got a two touchdown lead. Let's button it down and, get, and just solidify the run game. You still have to score points. Like you said, yeah, no, no, think, no lead is safe. Yeah. I think it, it's super key for the bucks. They have to score at a minimum. 30 points. I'd probably even say 33 points Yeah, because the chiefs offense is just, I don't want to say they're unstoppable, but they are the closest thing to unstoppable. They're just so difficult to, to figure out. But I think that's where having, I mean, that's why you bring in Tom Brady, right? You bring him in for moments like this to close the game out. And part of Brady's game, the bucks can hit the deep shots. You know, we saw the, the long ball to Scotty Miller. Brady's great down the field. But he's also a field general. So we know that he can pick players apart and he'll he'll dice them down the field over the middle, 15 yard game, keep the keep the drive moving. They'll mix in running the ball. The Bucs don't have to score on like a five play drive where they get a chunk play for 60 yards. In fact, right. they really shouldn't do that. It's a it's a interesting scenario they're in where yes, they have to score at least 30 points. And when you score that many points, Eventually, at some moment in the game, you're going to have like a, a run and gun type of big play thing. But at the same time, you also don't want to get into a shootout with Kansas City. Because if you get in a shootout with the Chiefs, the Chiefs are going to beat you nine times out of ten. Maybe the Bucks are that one time out of the ten. So it's going to be key to have long drives or at least intermediate drives where they can – go about their way, kill some clock. Obviously it's a long, it's 60 minute game. So you can't just like kill the clock on like the first drive of the game. But I think more importantly too, is for the Bucks defense. If the chiefs are going to score, make them drive all the way down the field. Don't, don't have another Tyreek Hill game where he has 13 receptions for 260 yards and three touchdowns, make them go all the way down the field because at worst, it'll be seven, nothing with plenty of time with, with, you're only going to be down seven, nothing. And you don't have to have that scare of like, Oh, if we, if we turn the ball over like really quickly or we go three and out, they're going to get the ball right back. And they're already feeling great because they just had an 80 yard bomb down the field. I think that's going to be a, a really big key to the Super Bowl. 
I think the thing is, if you have a 13 play drive, you better get seven out of it. You, you can't have that long drive and end up with three points or nothing. You're going to have to, as Hank Stram would say, matriculate down the field yes. and then get seven out of it. And that keeps your defense off the field, keeps them fresh because you're chasing those fast guys all over the place. You're going to have to have your defense rested, but they also have to be in a position where, but we're, we're rested, but we're also getting blitzed as well. We can't have that happen. Right, and another another big factor for the Bucks defense as well is, uh, is Vita Vey didn't play in that first game, as I mentioned. Right. Another guy that didn't play in that game either was Jamel Dean, their number two cornerback. And Jamel Dean, hands down, is their fastest cornerback. So maybe, right. I, don't, I don't know what Todd Bowles is thinking right now, I wouldn't hate the idea of putting Jamel Dean on Tyreek Hill, matching speed with speed, or they can end up going with cover two and having two safeties back there. I think that might be the better Fix way to up. go. Mix it up, though. You got to mix yeah. it up. You can't give them the same look all game long. Um, now, something that's been, at least as far as the general population is concerned, we haven't really looked at with this team. What about the special teams? Because most games like this come down to one play here, one play there, looking at a, a block punt or just a muff punt or something. What are the special teams, and, and, and what are we looking at as far as how are we going to elevate that? Because they haven't been spectacular, but they haven't been bad. Right. Uh, as far as the kicking game, Ryan Suckup has been amazing. <laughs> and I don't want to jinx him, but he's been amazing for the Bucks. Very solid on all of his extra points. He's made, I think, over 90% of his kicks. He's just been so consistent for this team that hasn't had a consistent kicker in over a decade. I don't know if you've heard about the Bucks curse, but there's been a Bucks kicker curse. It looks like they've got that settled with Ryan Suckup as their kicker. Uh, as far as the return game, the Bucks haven't necessarily – I wouldn't categorize it as a bad return game, but it, it's. I wouldn't say it's anything that's really been spectacular for them this season. They've had a little bit of a merry-go-round in terms of returners. It was Jaden Mickens, and then it was Kenyon Barner. Tyler Johnson did it for a game. But they've gone back to Jaden Mickens. Uh, he's been their most consistent guy. He led the team in receiving yards. I will say he had a very good NFC Championship game. He had – a great kick return that got the Bucks out to the 35 or 45 yard line and it led to a touchdown for the Bucks. He had another good uh, 10 yard punt return that set the Bucks up for another score. So if he can continue that trend, I mean, I think the biggest thing really with special teams is field position. You're always playing the, the field position game, the Bucks punt return or uh, the punt team. There has been a time or two where there's been a bit of a slip up. The New Orleans game in the regular season, they allowed a big chunk run. Uh, when, they, when they played the Detroit Lions, they blew them out. They only allowed seven points to the Lions, and it was on a punt return. Overall, they have a solid that they have a solid punt defense, but every now and then something has slipped through the cracks. It's not anything I'd really overly be worried about. Something to keep in the back of your mind because the Chiefs do have a very explosive I mean, they, they got – they're explosive all over the place, offense, right, defense, right. special teams. They Doesn't got guys right. that can run. Um, but, yeah, overall, I, I'm, I'm very confident in the Bucks special teams. Their special teams coordinator, Keith Armstrong, does a, does a really great job with them. And if Jaden Mickens can continue what he did in the last game, the Bucks will be in pretty good business, I would say. It, you, you made me think of the, the last kicker, and I'm thinking Martin Gramatica is the, the last kicker that you had that you go, okay, we can trust this guy. And that's yeah, well, been they a had while. a so the the kicker curse started because they had Matt Bryant, who was on the Falcons for a very long time. Right. They cut Matt Bryant. He went to Atlanta and had a very good career with the Falcons. Obviously, the Bucks saw him twice a year because they're in the division. Right. So that's where they say it pretty much started with. But yeah, I mean, Gramatica is an all timer. He uh, he does a radio show in Tampa too. So oh, he, yeah. really, yeah, he's pretty well known, and I think he does the the Spanish broadcast for the Bucks as well during their game. So yeah, he's a uh, still a big a big figure in uh, in Tampa. Well, one of the great things about a Super Bowl is that you're either playing in a dome or in a place where you're guaranteed pretty good weather. Yeah. One of the bad things about that is you've pretty much eliminated your kickoff return game. Because if you can't kick the ball into the end zone to get a touchback in these conditions, now if you're playing in, you know, outdoors in Minnesota or in Green Bay, wind swirl and you have a lot of different things you can worry about, here it's pretty much – can you catch the ball? Right. Take a knee, get off the field. 
And again, it's kind of the same thing that you're talking about why you brought Tom Brady in is let's be more reliable. Let's be more professional. Let's make sure we make fewer mistakes. And the fewer mistakes we make, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, and it's funny that you brought back that there's not really too many uh, kick returns anymore. Bradley Pinion there, he's their punter, but he does their kickoffs as well. Uh, he's he's very high up there in terms of the number of touchbacks among all the kickers in the NFL. But the forecast for Sunday's game is there's expected to be like a 75% chance yeah. of rain. So that can actually alter the way that the kickoffs are done. Maybe you end up squibbing it. Maybe you want guys to try to return it because they're going to be running a little bit slower with the wet fields so that you can tackle them at the 15 or the 10. So that could be in play more than you would see in other Super Bowls. But yeah, um, to your point about Brady, I think one of the biggest things Brady did coming to this team is not even what he's done on the field. It's everything that he's about off the field, about, you know, dedication to the team, getting along with his teammates, just the will and the drive to win. People see him and they see all the the accolades that come with him, reaching 10 Super Bowls. He's won six. He's going for a seventh. That resonates with players. It inspires them. He expects greatness, so they want to be great for him and to be to be great with them. And that's really helped the Bucs this season with cleaning up things just as penalties on the field. The Bucs were the most penalized team a year ago, and then they cleaned that up so much this season. And that's been a big part of them winning this season too. And we all know about the TB12 method with, with Tom – A lot of the players are using it now. Bruce Arians said that his wife was using the TB12 rehab for, I believe, a a knee surgery or some some kind of surgery she was going to have. So, you know, he comes into this locker room. Mike Evans was a guy, too, that hurt his knee in the last game of the season. And we didn't know if he was going to play in the postseason, at least for the first week. And he said, like, yeah, I rehabbed with the TB12 method and I'm good to go. So... Brady brings more than just what he does on the field. It's all the preparation and practice and all of those things that come with it. That has really been huge for this team. Well, I've got one question for you that hasn't been asked by a lot of people, at least not to my knowledge. And I think it's interesting. We saw when Mahomes went out and Chad Henney came in. Yeah. And it's not that they didn't miss a beat, but they were still able to do some of the things they needed to do. If, if something were to happen to Tom Brady, how comfortable is the team with the backup? I would say they're fairly comfortable with playing Gabbert. He actually got a lot of playing time in the Detroit game where they blew the lines out in the first half. Tom Brady didn't even play in the second half. So Blaine Gabbert played the all of the second half, which if something, God forbid, were to happen in the Super Bowl, it's great to have that experience with Blaine Gabbert for this season. I mean, he's a veteran. Um, Bruce Arians brought him here because he knew him uh, playing when Arians was coaching the Cardinals. So as far as knowing the system and everything like that, I don't think you could get a guy that knows the system even better. I mean, listen, you can't expect him to be Tom Brady. There's no other Tom Brady. He's the GOAT. I think he can do a well enough job where if the Bucs have a lead, he can maintain that lead and, and not make silly mistakes that would give the Chiefs uh, you know, another advantage. Obviously, the Bucs would change their game plan if Gabbard comes into the game. I don't think they necessarily take as many shots downfield. They'd probably try to work over the middle a little bit more. And if that run game's going, they're, they're going to rely heavy on that. I mean, we saw what happened with Nick Foles in the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. That that was great. And he obviously played like in the whole postseason. It wasn't like he was just yeah. playing yeah. in the playoffs. So you, you obviously don't want to be in that situation where the backup's going to play. If it has to happen, you still be a little worried. It's your backup quarterback. But I, I, as far as him knowing the offense and everything, he's well-suited for that. Well, as we were looking at the playoffs from a few weeks ago, and we know as being a quarterback-driven league, which almost every team relies on that guy, and we're talking about in the offseason, which we can get to another time, all the movements going to be going around in the league supposedly, you need a guy – at least that's been through the wars a little bit. He doesn't have to be able to supplant the starter, but he has to be someone that if you're looking at, you know, the the rookie eighth round pick out of, you know, Podunk state and you're getting ready, you're in the Super Bowl, that's not a good sign. But when you've got a Blaine Gabbert who started a number of games in the league 
and yeah. in, in a couple of different places, actually. Mm-hmm. It looks like he's got it under control, or at least he's not going to be phased by stuff. He may not have the talent of a Tom Brady, but at least he's not going to be phased by stuff. So you're in good shape there. Right. And I, I feel like most teams, their backup quarterback is either a grizzled veteran like Blaine Gabbard, as you just talked about, or it's that that rookie or second year guy that's an up and coming quarterback who's kind of ready to take the take the role maybe next season. So right now he's just sitting and absor- absorbing the game at the NFL level. I don't think that's necessarily the guy you want to put in with the Super Bowl on the line. I think right. it's right. best going with the veteran there. Right. Well, Matt, I know that you're very busy this week. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I would love to be able to uh, stop back and talk to you uh, maybe in a few weeks after the Super Bowl championship celebration settles down there in Tampa <laughs> Bay. Um, I appreciate what you do. I appreciate what you're doing this week because without you and, and, and your organization, the people that do what you do, we would have no idea what's happening. And we just have to wait. Hey, we've got two weeks between games. What's going on? So to be able to read what you guys do and all the stuff that you're doing, I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thanks for the kind words. Uh, it was great to be on. Thanks for having me, and we'll definitely do it again. And make sure to check okay. out pewterreport.com and the Pewter Report podcast. Okay. You, you answered the next question for me. I was going to make sure we get all the links to everything, so <laughs> make sure you get everything posted up. Thank you, sir. I appreciate right, th- it. Thanks a lot. No problem.